Uh, first timers, who's here for the first time? About a quarter of the audience. So I'm going to take a second to explain the Science Cafe format for you. Tonight especially, nuclear power, nuclear waste, it's definitely an issue that has the science behind it, but we all have opinions and feelings and thoughts and what we've heard about it. And the Science Cafe format's designed to drag that out of you. So tonight, be prepared to talk about what you feel about nuclear power, what you think about it, if you think it's right for America going forward, what you think about nuclear waste, think about nuclear terrorism, all of it. If this is your opportunity to speak your mind and have one of the experts in the field, you're now officially an expert in the field, <laughs> uh, discuss that with you. So the entire format's driven on a discussion model. If uh, You're welcome to ask any question you want. It's very informal. Uh, Tonight, what we're going to do to start is actually I'm going to find out what you guys think about nuclear power and nuclear waste and nuclear terrorism. And then Professor Muller is going to go into his presentation, a short presentation on it. And then we're going to continue with questions and dialogue thereafter. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the format? Uh, about midway through, we'll take a break and uh, you'll be able to get more drink. You'll be able to get drink, more drinks and food from our gracious host, the Atlas Cafe. Uh, there is a yellow sign-up sheet at the front counter. You can put your name and email on that to sign up for the mailing list. That would be uh, your best way to keep up to date on what we're doing. We're here the third Monday of every month, except next month. We're taking a month off. We'll be back January of 09. So this is your last chance for science conversation this year. That's right, this is it. So be prepared to, to talk tonight. Are there any questions before we get started? Fantastic. Well, without further ado, I want to introduce Professor Richard Muller. He actually uh, was a former professor of mine. Can I tell a little anecdote to start? I'm going to tell a little anecdote. What if I said <laughs> it's, I'm already holding the mic in my hand. So it's, I, did, I did not flunk the class. I did, I did fairly well in the class. But I got to tell you, so I took uh, Professor Muller electro, uh, electricity and magnetism course uh, back 12 years ago. And I'll be honest, there's not much I remember from the course. <laughs> but the thing I do remember is there was one sidebar. Uh, one day, we started talking about nuclear power. And there was a definite feeling in the air in the audience that nuclear power was bad. And without really going into the question of bad or good, uh, we had a conversation about the science behind nuclear power. And it was one of the most thoughtful and engaging conversations I ever had in college. And it had me think, well, is it? And I started to investigate myself, started to look into the facts behind nuclear power. And that's what I hope to create for you guys tonight, because if you, if you all leave with a, as memorable as a, a lecture day that I had 12 years ago, I think uh, we'll provide a, a great uh, evening for you. So without further ado, this is Professor Richard Muller. A uh, former professor of mine. He's a professor of physics at UC Berkeley. And he's also a faculty senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, let's give them all a big hand. <laughs> well, I'm actually. I'm gonna. But before he has a chance to talk, I'm gonna do my Phil Donahue impression, and uh, I'm gonna find out what you think about nuclear power. So, I do this quickly. So, concise statements. Power great, waste messy. Nuclear waste messy. Nuclear waste not good. 
uh, using it in depleted uranium, use, using depleted uranium in weaponry over in Iraq and Afghanistan, really not good. Irradiating land and soldiers and all that kind of stuff. But I don't personally think there's anything wrong with nuclear power, especially if we can design something to contain, you know, waste appropriately, and it's relatively clean. So the concern. Okay, we're, we're going to talk closer into the mic so everybody can hear. But uh, to sum up, that statement was power good, waste bad. I think I got that sum up. What are the other feelings about nuclear power? With our, with our very own star up in the sky, why? Is it necessary? Let's just use the sun. Is it necessary? That's a good question. I'm coming to the back. No, I can shout it. It's part of the solution. It's part. What's the part of the problem part? Yeah. What's the part of the problem? Uh, the part of the problem is that the the waste sticks around for so long. The waste lasts for so long, and what what about the waste that that lasts for so long? Why why is it worse than a landfill or uh, that big plastic garbage patch out in the Pacific? It lasts longer than all that stuff, and it's more hazardous. It's more hazardous. What about more? What about nuclear terrorism? That's something that we heard a lot about during this run-up to the election. The threat of a dirty bomb. The threat of uh, North Korea uh, uh, acquiring nuclear weaponry. Any feelings about that or thoughts? Excellent. No thought. <laughs> With the new globalization energy project or planning, it's going to become much easier for people to get reconstituted plutonium. And reconstituted plutonium leads to? Much greater possibility of nuclear terrorism. Of nuclear terrorism. Specifically a nuclear bomb, is that where? Specifically a nuclear bomb. Is there anyone else that's worried about proliferation of plutonium or uranium? Is there somebody here that had it? Potential for giant nuclear accidents. Giant nuclear accidents, such as what? Chernobyl. Such as Chernobyl. And what what happened at Chernobyl? Just like refresher. <laughs> you're you're putting that. But what do you remember about Chernobyl at this point? Um, a lot of people got injured and killed. A lot of people got killed in Chernobyl. Does every does anyone remember what happened at Chernobyl? What happened to the populace around Chernobyl? Um, well, the people who went in, a lot of people who went in to try and contain it died, but the populace were um, removed, obviously, it was, it was the town nearby, the town was, but anyway, that, that town's completely empty now, and obviously they had to scrape all the soil off, and uh, basically it's mothballed right now. <coughs> uh, not as many people died as they think, and there wasn't as many tumours or cancer, in fact, there's lots of animals still living there, they're, they're living perfectly right. What's the lasting impact on Chernobyl on your own? psyche or uh, how you feel about nuclear power? Um, I have no problem with nuclear power. It's when people start experimenting and basically start trying to do things and they should obviously design a lot of better safeguards than what they have right now. And it's coming up with the better methods and there's old, old tech, technologies because there's always politics involved where they're trying to use the waste fuel for nuclear, uh, for um, uh, enrichment and other things like that. So you have to have a very clear policy that everybody agrees with. So uh, we'll take just uh, a la any last comments or, or questions before we, we get started. Well, there's the nuclear power industry always says that they have safeguards for protecting uh, the environment, and yet the Humboldt Bay PG&E plant was shut down 30, 35, 40 years ago, and there is still contamination, in fact, there's contamination measured across the street in the schoolyard. So if uh, you know if that's the idea of containment, then we've got some real problems in terms of exposure to radiation. Well, there you. I think we did a, a good job of eliciting uh, 
I think most people were, were relatively positive on nuclear power. I think 12 years ago it wasn't that way. Is that, is that correct? The public attitude towards nuclear has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. But the attitude towards waste and contamination and concern over um, continued waste and a policy around it is still fairly negative. Well, that's, that's the outstanding question in the minds of, <clears throat> I'd, I'd say, the majority of people these days. Uh, most of them accept the fact that the uh, nuclear accident is not really the big issue, but that it's the question of nuclear waste storage. So before we get into some of these larger questions that have come out, which are, there are a lot of great points that are brought up, why don't we get into a little bit of the basic science behind a lot of these issues, and then we'll come back out and start addressing a lot more of these questions in greater depth. Okay, can I have the good mic? Oh, they're both working. They're both working, okay. I, I did prepare a little bit presentation, but uh, the, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll go through it quickly. The first part of it has to do with nuclear weapons and nuclear terrorism. And then I have some, some things about nuclear waste storage. And I could talk about other aspects of nuclear reactors uh, if, if, if you wish. Uh, when you look at a nuclear bomb um, and ask what would happen if we dropped one of our bombs from a B-52 in New York City, uh, this is the area that's destroyed. And you know this, this is horrific, really enormous uh, damage. Um, but what I want to do is not talk about that. That's the Cold War. That's Russia and U.S. Uh, what I really wanted to talk about was more nuclear terrorism, what's happening in North Korea, what's happening in, in Iran. So let me say a few words about that. Uh, there, there are basically two types of bombs. And, and this, is, this is useful. Uh, when you're watching world events to think about uh, what's going on, it's helpful to know that there are two fundamental types of bombs. Well, there are three if you include the H-bomb. But to get an H-bomb to work, you have to first trigger it with a fission bomb. And there are two types of fission bombs. So any, anybody who's going to build one of these things has to build a fission bomb first. That's plenty big enough to do a lot of damage. That's, we use fission bombs to destroy uh, Hiroshima, kill 50, 150,000 people. I don't know what the number is. Uh, Nagasaki, similar horror. Uh, so we use fission bombs there. Let me just say a few words about those. Um, there are two types. One of them is based on uranium, uranium-235. Uh, uranium-235 is a kind of uranium that's very hard to separate out from natural uranium. When you do separate out uranium-235, what's left over is called depleted uranium. There was a mention of depleted uranium. We use that in shells, in artillery, not because of its radioactivity, but because of its penetrating power. It's just very, very good for that. Yes, it has some radioactivity, and people worry about that. Uh, but extracting out, it's less than 1%, and you have to enrich it to almost 100%, and that's really hard to do. Very hard to purify. Once you've purified it, then what you do is you take two pieces, each one less than a critical mass, shoot them together in a gun or a cannon, that's relatively straightforward, uh, and then they'll explode. Uh, in World War II, we made a one uranium bomb, and we exploded it over Hiroshima. We never tested it. The test at Alamogordo was not a uranium bomb. We only had enough uranium for one bomb. And it was a gun design. When people say a high school student could design a bomb, that's what they're talking about. The bomb is really easy to design. The hard thing is getting the uranium. Typically, we worry, we use, we, we use uh, diffusion plants. These are these big factories that are like a mile square. And, and uh, you can use centrifuges. When you hear that Iran is developing a centrifuge plant, what they do is they spin the uranium so that the heavier stuff goes to the outside and the wider, and these use the, the special meraging steels, these tubes that they spin. They are to purify the uranium. Once you have the uranium, then it's easy to make a bomb. When you hear the debate, when they say in Iran, they, they're not really looking to make a bomb, they just want to purify uranium for a reactor, it's worthwhile recognizing that one, that's a legitimate argument, and two, once they have the devices to purify to the three or four percent for a reactor, it's really easy to purify to the 100 percent. Same devices, you just run them longer. And then it's really easy to have a bomb. You don't need a bomb design at that point. That's really easy. So there are these two sides to the issue in, in Iran. 
uh, they have a legitimate reason to have uranium purifiers. After all, they don't want to be dependent on the U.S. for their supply of uranium. At the same time, they're developing precisely the technology that they need to have a really simple, easy, first time works uh, nuclear bomb. So that makes that issue complicated. Um, now, there's another kind of bomb. I, I was never need a test. And by the way, I'm not, now I'm going to tell you something that you, you're going to say, wait a minute, who's he? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Hey, he just said something that I know is wrong. So let me say it, and you can react that way. And that is, it was a uranium bomb that Saddam Hussein was developing, and that he had enriched it to 35%. No, wait a minute, you, no, he wasn't doing anything, right? You're confusing the two Gulf Wars, if that's what you thought. At the end of the first Gulf War, uh, the UN went into Baghdad. The US didn't. The UN went into Baghdad. He allowed them to inspect his facilities. They found the bomb facilities. They dismantled them, destroyed them, took photographs, and left. Uh, based in part on that, when, after the second Gulf War, many people in the United States thought he was doing it again. And it turns out they were all wrong. So those are the two events. But keep them straight, because it, it, it illustrates the uranium bomb. Uh, the plutonium bomb is something else. The plutonium bomb, as someone mentioned, there's a danger of using, when you have a lot of nuclear reactors, nuclear reactors do two things. They make energy, in the form of heat, used to boil water, turns a turbine, gives you electricity. The other thing a nuclear reactor does is it converts ordinary uranium, the depleted kind of uranium, the uranium-238, converts it into plutonium. Plutonium is useful for new nuclear reactors. It's also useful for a bomb. In World War II, we didn't know which one, we didn't know whether the uranium would be ready in time. And so they also developed plutonium. Plutonium being a much harder bomb to make. It's relatively easy to get plutonium, assuming you have a nuclear reactor. Probably nobody in this room does. But North Korea does, Iran does, Iraq did. Uh, there are, you know, so these things, if you have that, we gave the technology under Eisenhower, we gave the technology for nuclear reactors away to developing countries. The idea was, we'll give you the technology so you can get this kind of power. The only agreement you have to do is that we will inspect and make sure you're not diverting the plutonium to make a bomb. And when North Korea says, well, we don't, we don't think you have been fulfilling your part of the bargain, we're cutting off inspections, the suspicion was that they were doing that so they could extract the plutonium out of the reactor and make a bomb out of it. And in fact, that's exactly what it turned out was happening. So we used, and the bomb is really hard to make. You have to implode it. That's like squeezing a water balloon. And it tends to go off prematurely and then it doesn't give much yield. It, it's, it, it's very difficult to get this thing to go off takes very advanced experiments for this implosion. You have to make sure there's not too much plutonium-240 in it, things like that that cause pre-detonation. Uh, for this reason, we used half of our plutonium in a test, a test at Almogordo, Trinity test site. It was the first atomic bomb ever exploded, but not in anger. This was preparation. The second plutonium bomb, using up our plutonium, was exploded in anger over Nagasaki, killing 50 to 150,000 people, destroying the city. So those are the two, two I, I just want to get the nuclear story straight on that. It's important for every aspect of this. Uh, by the way, this is the United Nations photograph of the uh, uranium purifier that they found Saddam Hussein having. You can find this on the web. Uh, I, the irony, I, I, one of the reasons I show this picture is that um, people were looking for centrifuges and they were looking for laser enrichment and they were looking for diffusion plants and there weren't any of these things. It turned out Saddam wasn't using any advanced technology to purify uranium. He was using a device that was invented by Ernst Lawrence of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, from which Lawrence had used to purify all the uranium in World War II. It was a big mass spectrometer, very slow. Basically, you run it for a year, you get one bomb. That's what Saddam was doing. It was a mass spectrometer in which you send the beams into a big curved vacuum vessel. It was shaped like the letter C. Now, Lawrence was a professor at Cal, and so he, he decided to nickname this thing the cal Utron. <laughs> for, for some reason, when we give tours on the Berkeley campus, uh, this famous use of the word cal is usually not mentioned. Question? Yeah. 
mentioned there was two situations with the first Gulf War and the second. But yes. Wasn't, didn't in the early 80s that the Israelis bombed the, the nuclear reactor, you know, on the cover of the flu? Oh, there, there was Can you restate the question, too? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he refers to uh, a time when the Israeli bombed a nuclear reactor that was in uh, Iraq. And, and, and that, that, that is true. That would have produced a plutonium bomb. Uh, so uh, let's take an example of a so-called rogue state. I, I, I don't like that term because I don't know what makes them rogue other than we don't like them. But let's take North Korea. Uh, they did cut off inspections. They did explode a bomb. Uh, the bomb uh, released energy. Was it enough to destroy New York City or San Francisco? Let me show you how much damage that bomb would have done if it were exploded near here. Oh, this is New York City. Sorry. There it is. In the middle of Central Park. Doesn't quite reach the edges of the park. Uh, here in San Francisco, oh, there it is. It's, actually, this is a bigger one. Uh, th this circle is for one that's about two and a half times bigger than the North Korean nuke. Because this was the lowest one that I could find on the Federation of American Scientists website. They have a little website where you can can do these things. By the way, that's one of the things we got to say about FAS, Federation of American Scientists, best place to go for really reliable data when you want to find out more about this subject. But the North Korean so they they have a a spot where you can. Yeah, you, you can blow up a bomb uh, uh, up in the air, you can blow it up down there, you can make a map on your city. Uh, so uh, so, so any, any size you want. It's, it's a really little widget, not a widget, it's a... <laughs> anyway. Uh, so it's interesting when you think about world events to recognize the energy released in the, the Trinity test site in, in New Mexico uh, was eight, was 20,000 tons of TNT. Keep that number in mind, 20 zero, zero, zero. The energy released in the North Korean test was 400, zero, zero, 400. They used as much plutonium as, the, as in the Nagasaki bomb. And, but instead of giving 20,000 tons, it gave 400 tons. It was a fizzle, thereby illustrating how hard it is to make a plutonium bomb. It's a useful thing to remember and may reflect why North Korea is so eager to negotiate your bombs away now. It really, really didn't work. How much damage did it do? 400 tons. Let me give you something by comparison. Here is, I'm about to show you a release of energy that was over twice as large as the North Korean nuke. Here's an interesting fact, and this is why I advise the government that in my opinion, yes, put some money into worrying about terrorists sneaking in a nuclear weapon, but I think that's very unlikely. They released over twice the energy by taking a jet plane and driving into the World Trade Center. Here's the numbers. A uh, jet plane carried 60 tons of jet fuel. Here's a surprising number that even most physics professors don't know. When you burn jet fuel, it releases more energy than when you explode TNT. Not by a little factor. It's 15 times as much energy. So 60 tons of jet fuel was equivalent to 900 tons of TNT. Remember, the North Korean nuke was four, 400 tons. So more than twice the energy. Even more. When you burn it slowly, it can do more damage than an explosion. The reason is an explosion typically just explodes the explosive. Uh, most of the energy will shoot right past a column, whereas if you heat that column slowly until it buckles, you don't have to melt it. Just heat it a little bit. Take a soda straw and press it together. And it's very strong, surprisingly, considering it's only paper. If you push a little bit harder, suddenly it goes. Catastrophically, that's what happened to the World Trade Center. I could talk about that at length, too. But that gets us a little bit off the subject of nuclear. Let me just, since we don't want to go on with this too long, let me talk a little bit about the big issue that concerned everybody. Oh, there are issues of fallout. The, the number, by the way, for the most reliable number, for the, the number of people killed by the Chernobyl nuclear accident, is 24,000. Okay, that's a huge number. It's not quite Hiroshima, but
but we're talking in the same breath. So this was a really horrific accident. There are a couple of things you need to know. One is that the Chernobyl reactor was one that so horrified everybody in the West, we would never build anything like that. It had no containment. As soon as it started burning, all the radioactivity came spewing out. It was a really, really bad design. Uh, second thing is, and this is, this is one that I give my students as a paradox. Of those 24,000 deaths, the number that we can, the number of actual cases that we can attribute to Chernobyl, people who died who say, yes, that's Chernobyl, is about 80. Most of these deaths take place over in these remote regions where the dose was so low that the calculated increase in cancer is, goes up by a hundredth of a, about a hundredth of a percent. So if you have if normally our chance of dying of cancer all around the world, some places it's 18%, some it's 24%, let's say it's 20%. That's typically those of us who from cancer from so-called natural cancer. But if we got this kind of dose in this region, the chance would go up from 20% to 20.01%. Now that, it turns out, kills 24,000 people. But they are not easily counted because there are 4 million people in this area and the 24,000, of those 4 million people, you know, about 1 million will die of cancer, plus 24,000. So statistically, it won't be observed. That doesn't mean it's not real. It is real. These are people who would not have died of cancer otherwise. So it's a horrible thing, but you're not going to see it. Uh, there's a movie called Chernobyl Heart, which you've got to dismiss. That was, that was not scientific or accurate or anything. It, it's, it's really an embarrassing movie. But, but, but these are the numbers. I'm saying 24,000 is really bad. Uh, Why don't we pause for a second and take a few questions? Well, first, one more thing. Okay. I'm going to talk about nuclear waste. Just briefly talk, because that was the big issue. That's what it's getting up to. Okay. Uh, nuclear waste uh, is, is considered the big barrier to nuclear power. Um, back when we abandoned nuclear power, 30 years ago, stop building new plants or stop licensing new plants. The general feeling was, look, radioactivity is dangerous, it's unknown, we don't understand it. Well, those some of us do, but the public doesn't. You would have to educate them to get them to accept this. Uh, how dangerous is it? Well, probably not as dangerous as they think, but, but Ralph Nader was out there advocating very strongly against it. He, picked, he, he, he chose that issue as a, as, a, as a main issue. A lot of it is simply they didn't, people don't trust the companies that run the nuclear reactors. That's a, that's a big part of it. And, of course, we had an alternative that was very cheap and super clean. It was called oil. And 30 years ago, the general public thought that there was no pollution from oil. Well, you get some nitrous oxides, but you put in a catalytic converter. And, 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 and you know, a few other things that come out, you, you get rid of those, and then you have nothing coming out, nothing spewing out other than clean, harmless carbon dioxide. And that was the feeling 30 years ago. That was when I resigned from the Sierra Club, because I wrote a letter to them explaining that the carbon dioxide given off by fossil fuels is very likely to lead to significant warming of the Earth. Where that could be a catastrophic disaster. I wrote that letter 30 years ago. I wish I had a copy. But I did resign over that issue. Uh, so I, I think these days, the first starting point on nuclear power is not simply to say, well, we've got to dismiss it because it's dangerous. The alternative is dangerous. Solar is my favorite. I like wind. The bottom line, though, is that until those are cheap enough for China and India and the developing world, until they're cheap enough for them to be able to afford it, or unless we're willing to subsidize it in the developing world, they're going to go to coal or nuclear, much rather than go to nuclear. Coal is three times dirtier than natural gas. And they you have to recognize the US is more responsible than any other country for global warming. We have contributed one quarter of the world's global warming, and we have a tiny fraction of the population. So we have, the global warming so far, by the way, happens to be about one degree Fahrenheit. We have contributed 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's actually what we have contributed. 
we don't worry about the one degree Fahrenheit. You may think it, that's caused the fires of, 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 of Angel Island, but no, it's only been a degree Fahrenheit. The thing we worry about is the future global warming, where it's very likely the temperature will go up by five or seven degrees Fahrenheit, and that will change our way of living. But here's the bad news. The bad news is that's not going to come from the US, even if George Bush was still president. It wouldn't come from the United States. It would come from China and India, because their economies are developing so rapidly. China has been going up 10% a year. Uh, its emissions have been going up 12% a year. And the predicted global warming is going to come primarily from China and India. And so we can't have the luxury of using alternative energy if it's alternative energy for the wealthy. Anyway, uh, we can talk about the dangers of nuclear power. This is actually a plot of what happens to the waste. And I, I've, I've been meeting with top leaders, trying to convince them that the danger of nuclear waste, when compared to the dangers of fossil fuel, are not so bad. What are the dangers of fossil fuel? Well, there are two dangers. One of them is global warming, carbon dioxide being the main greenhouse gas. And the second one is, of course, war in the Mideast. Would we be at war in the Mideast if it weren't for fossil fuels? These are the Chernobyls of fossil fuels. So let's talk about nuclear waste, since it's right up there on the screen. Uh, who has a question about nuclear waste? I don't have a question about nuclear waste. The paradox that you mentioned earlier, I didn't understand. There's no paradox. Uh, it's only a paradox that people think if you can't observe something that's bad, then maybe it's not there. So how do we know those people have died? The answer is by calculation. By assuming that if you have 1% of the dose, your chance of getting cancer is 1% as big. We have the, the evidence, I can show you the evidence, that's called the linear hypothesis. There's no way of observing, nobody has ever demonstrated in any way that one rem of cancer, that's the level to what most of Sweden, that, that causes cancer. Nobody's ever demonstrated that. I think it's true. But it's not based on experimental observation. It's based on my theoretical understanding of the mechanisms of cancer. So that, 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 I mean, call that a paradox if you want. We're having 24,000 people who will die unnecessarily, uh, who otherwise wouldn't have died, but we won't identify any of them. I'm going to switch with you, because that one works far better farther away. So this mic works fine. So uh, on the nuclear waste. <laughs> What's that? Have a oh, you have a follow-up question. Well, isn't it the big problem, a big part of the problem is that the uh, government of USSR really um, stifled any information on that. So people were unaware of the, the dangers and the, the, the fallout wasn't really addressed appropriately. I had I, actually been traveling to USSR uh, shortly before and after that. and. Uh, the fact is, I don't believe the government was covering up. I think they were just ill-informed. It was a rapidly developing accident in which, as near as I can tell, they were trying to get the information out as quickly and accurately as they could. But we didn't get that quick and accurate information. And our own head of the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, made an announcement that caused, caused me to uh, be horrified. I think... Yeah, all right, we'll trade back. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The head of the Senate Intelligence Committee said that the Russians have announced that the nuclear chain reaction had, been, had stopped. And anybody who knows anything about nuclear power knows that's not the case. Well, of course the chain reaction had stopped. The Russian announcement was exactly uh, accurate. Once the nuclear core was dismantled, the chain reaction stops. He was confusing the chain reaction with the residual radioactivity from the fission fragments. So it wasn't just Russia. I mean, it, the trouble is our leaders don't know any science at all. And so they say things, and they'll say them very righteously, and they'll just be wrong because they don't know the physics. And those of us who know a little bit of physics will listen to that and groan. So, uh, but I think this issue of trust is an important one. I think it, I think it has to do with, again, uh, also with global warming. Um, We're going to take a question in the back here. Uh, so I do have a question about nuclear waste. Um, how would, how nasty is this stuff, okay. um, and how dangerous is it when it's 
you know, we'll, but in the way that we handle it. Hang on, hang on one second. What do you, what have you heard about nuclear waste, and what's your own uh, interpretation of what you've heard in terms of how nasty it is? On the official, this is a science cafe, so on the nasty scale, how nasty is it? So on a, based on what I hear, you know, it's a, it's a nastiness scale on a nine or a ten, you know, on a scale of ten. But yeah, I'd, I'd put it nine point nine. Boy, yeah, it's bad stuff. Like, what do you, what have you heard that it, that it does, and what have you heard about nuclear waste as a, as a whole? Well, I mean, it obviously contains a lot of radioactivity, but I guess my question is, when it's, you know, contained, or when we're shipping it across the country to a disposal site or something like that. I mean, we ship a lot of nasty materials around this country. Um, so, how, how dangerous is it really in terms of uh, how we contain it, how we move it, how we store it? Because um, what I hear is we're storing it at the nuclear power plants now, and that's not necessarily the best place to keep them. Okay. Uh, first, let me let me address it in two parts. I, I said that in a nuclear reactor, you create plutonium. Plutonium has a half life of 24,000 years. So a lot of people say we've got to wait 24,000 years for the plutonium to go away. But after 24,000 years, it's only half gone. There's another 24,000 after that, and only half of that is gone. So you got one quarter of it left after 48,000 years. So it really lasts a long time. Okay. Now, when I talk to the real experts on nuclear waste, the people that have to you know, convince other scientists that this is really a problem, it's really interesting. Because none of them are concerned about plutonium. The public is concerned about plutonium, but when you get to the halls of Congress, when you get to people really looking at this, they say, oh, plutonium's no problem. Now, why is that? It's because it's extremely insoluble in water. Uh, you could have water dribbling through plutonium and very, very little gets into the water. Uh, secondly, if you drink it, plutonium isn't very dangerous to your esophagus, to your digestive system. It turns out the danger of plutonium comes if you inhale it in. So for groundwater, the experts just say, you know, that's what the public are interested in. We need to have President Obama explain to the public, stop worrying about plutonium. So that can be stored relatively easily uh, with, with really, without much, much danger. I'll, I'll get to here in a moment. The other stuff is the stuff that's more dangerous. Now, I've plotted here what happens to that other stuff. And here's the radioactivity when the reactor was running. It was up here. It drops down. This is actually a factor of about 15. It's a log scale. And then it continues to drop and drop. And after 100 years, it's down to uh, this level. It's way below what it was originally. I would argue at this point, the radioactivity is so low that it's relatively easy to store. I mean, the radioactivity is it's 100 times greater than the uranium that was mined to make the reactor go. That sounds bad, but it's only 100. We're not talking about millions. It's only 100. If you could store that with a 10% chance that 10% would leak, you're back where you started. And that doesn't include all the uranium that's in the earth that we didn't mine. If you separate out the plutonium and worried about this, this stuff is relatively short-lived. I, I, in, in my book, I, I, I try to be nonpartisan on almost everything, but I get so annoyed when people talk about the 24,000 year half-life of plutonium and ignore the fact that that's not the danger. And this stuff goes down relatively quickly. I think we could store it for 100 years. We're pretty safe. What, what about the legitimate uh, question of, do we know for sure that this is how it's going to go? Are there unknowns still to be dealt with? Not, not in this. This, this decay is. This science is really well known. The decay that, 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 that's pattern that's very well known. We know what elements are in there. We, we, we know what their half lives are. What I've done here is for each element, I've plotted the individual decays of each of the elements, and there's the sum. So, this is. I don't think this is disputed by anybody. It's just, it's just that if you worry about the plutonium, so you had a, did you have a question? Yeah. It was basically oh. related to the, uh, the Russian spy who was poisoned by the Soviet Union. Ah, this is Litvinenko. Litvinenko, yeah. Litvinenko, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, Litvinenko, that's an interesting story. Because Litvinenko was poisoned by the Soviet Union. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
brought it to my class the next day. It was, it was only about 5% of what I needed, but I, I only wanted to spend $10. You know, I didn't want to spend, spend $200. So I, I got not enough to kill somebody, but enough to, and I didn't order it from a radioactive site, I ordered it from a camera shop. Because polonium-210 is used in camera brushes, used to make sure that you don't get dust on your negatives, if anybody here is old enough to know what a negative was. So, so um, the question is, why would you kill someone using this? What he suffered from was not cancer, it was radiation illness that you get from a big dose. Why do this rather than kill them the old-fashioned way? And, and I, I kind of predict that this was the first nuclear assassination, probably the last nuclear assassination. Because it's a rather strange way to do it. You do it because you want him to suffer on the screen. You want him to, to die slowly. You want to make a point or something like that. But arsenic is so much easier. <laughs> or a gun. Well, there's your takeaway for tonight. <laughs> we have another question back here. If plutonium is most dangerous when inhaled, what is your estimate of the plutonium dust in the atmosphere through, that's been left through testing? Yeah, nobody can find any in the atmosphere from testing. Uh, the plutonium, to, to really be inhaled in the lungs, the size has to be between sort of five and, and, and seven microns in size. That's just the size of anthrax spores. That's what makes anthrax so dangerous. But plutonium is more dangerous than anthrax by, I don't know, a factor of 20 or 30 or something like that. But even anthrax doesn't stay up in the air. It, the, these particles are large enough that after a day, they're, they're, they're basically all on the ground. Uh, there is a substance that if you were to eat it, not eat it, if you were to breathe it in, would be a thousand times more toxic than plutonium. That's Botox. Handle it carefully and don't breathe it in. Botox used to get rid of wrinkles is actually botulism toxin. And again, I'm not saying anything controversial. I'm trying not to say anything controversial here. Every, almost everything I'm saying, except when I get to nuclear waste, uh, is something where essentially all people who are knowledgeable on the subject agree. I, I tell my class, I don't care whether you're pro-nuke or anti-nuke. You know, let's learn about nukes. On the nuclear waste, I tend to go a little bit off because I, I, I really fear the fossil fuels so much more. I, I was going to actually ask about Yucca Mountain. Print. Why is there such controversy about Yucca Mountain? Okay, Yucca Mountain, for those of you who might not know, is a test facility where we're testing whether we can store nuclear waste there. And it has an interesting history. Let, let me put some, give you some numbers first. If you talk about how much radiation dose you get from the atmosphere, just because in the chairs, you know, the, you, alcohol, you know, alcohol, Another little story. It's required to be radioactive or it's not considered fit to drink in the U.S. That, that, because it has to be made out of grain or fruit. And those things get carbon from the air, and carbon from the air has carbon-14 in it. So things are, 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 are radioactive. I can expand on that. But let me just say that we get 300, 350 millirem per year on average from various sources of radioactivity. About half of that's natural. Half comes from x-rays and things like that. Um, Yucca Mountain is required by law, that if you live 20 miles downstream from Yucca Mountain and live there your entire life at that location, and you drink all of the water that's coming from a well that's downstream from Yucca Mountain, that the limit that Yucca Mountain is required to match is 15 millirem. 15, one five. Whereas your natural radioactivity is uh, 350. And so people debate, well, are you really getting 15 or is it really up to 20? Or what, you know, what is it? The, 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 I can tell you the history of how that 15 number was picked. But it was picked in large part because they asked the scientists, how well can you do? And they said, well, we no trouble to get below 15. OK, 15. And then it becomes a debating point of whether they have actually reached this goal. But it's so, so much less than we all get. You know, if you go to Denver, I said 350 millirem. That's what we get here. You know what you get in Denver? You get about 450 millirem. Do we evacuate Denver? You know, we're not, we're doing this in a way of, of simply trying to appeal to the people who are not willing to learn anything about radioactivity, who really fear it. And hey, if we make the number low enough, even they won't worry about it. But that's not been the case. When you make the number so low, then people say, what if there is this kind of earthquake? Maybe then it'll go up to 20. And I, I think, I think the real dangers are not from 
nuclear waste. They're from fossil fuels, in my mind. Well, does anyone disagree on the subject of Yucca Mountain? Do, does anyone feel like there is a legitimate component to the political battle over Yucca Mountain? There you go. These people need to get elected to Congress. Uh, <laughs> yeah, be devil's advocate. Okay, tra trans how about transport to Yucca Mountain? Uh, this is an interesting thing. Is what they've done is they built these super, super trucks, which are thick concrete and reinforced concrete. And, and these things are designed so that even if a terrorist got them, they couldn't blow it open with a shaped charge if they wanted to. So they have these things there. Um, and, and then to show how safe they are, they drop them off cliffs on trucks, and the whole thing bursts into flames, and the concrete container, of course, survives just perfectly. And this is supposed to make you feel safe about, it doesn't work that way. Everybody comes away thinking how terrible it is. Uh, in, in terms of, of, of transportation, you know, the things you worry about are transportation of gasoline, transportation of chlorine, transportation of all sorts of chemicals. Those are, those are factors of a thousand times more dangerous than the transportation of nuclear waste in my estimation. And yeah, we should worry about those. But, but uh, people say, yeah, but nuclear waste, we don't want to add on yet another worry. Well, except to the extent that it subtracts from the worry of fossil fuels. Well, here's a, that's a Isn't it safer to, uh, rather than have all the nuclear waste distributed in many, many locations, uh, to have them at one location? I would think. Yeah, that. yeah, I, I agree strongly. And one, of, I, I wrote an article for Technology Review saying just what you said, that. Uh, as someone mentioned, maybe it was you, that we, we keep our nuclear waste now right next to the nuclear power plant. That's because there's no approved place to send it. I've been talking to the California Energy Commission, I've been talking to one of our senators, trying to convince them, look, this is not a dangerous issue on the scale of things that we consider dangerous issues today. We, we need to do this. And, and, uh, and, and getting the nuclear waste away from these power plants where they really could be terrorist targets. Uh, I'm less worried about that than some people because I've been to a nuclear power plant and seen their counter-terror operations. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's certainly better to put it in Yucca Mountain where it's made into a solid, it's not gonna leak, all sorts of, it's really very safe. Um, over in, uh, correct me where it is, but it's in Sweden or Finland, they've got these huge salt mines where they're preparing to put all the yeah. waste and everything. I, I don't know if it's for just Sweden or is it for the rest of Europe, but could you well, the salt, salt correct salt, me on this? No, no, I, I actually not, don't remember which country it is either. But uh, these salt deposits have been there for millions of years, and obviously there's no water where the salt would have dissolved, so people consider that super safe. And there are lots of similar salt domes in the United States. Many of them have been proposed as waste storage sites. I think we have lots of potential waste sites, but it, it, it's hard to do when you have your senator who decides to take this on as a political issue, become a hero by opposing nuclear power, by scaring people. Um, what, what, is, what does France and Japan do with their nuclear waste, well, uh, since they're such yeah. huge nuclear power consumers? Well, they, they extract out the plutonium, and then they, they're, 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 they, the waste is, I believe they're storing their waste actually in a uh, developing country <laughs> where they pay them to, to do it. Just Irish because, Sea. Where Irish Sea. The Irish that? Sea, okay. <laughs> I should look up, look that up, and learn more about Irish Sea. Okay. Are you serious? <laughs> they're they're taking their waste and sending it to they're, they're another. The short-lived stuff, yeah. I, I, that's what I've heard. I, I should look into that so, so I can. Dumping it in the Irish Sea. See, I, I don't like dumping it in the sea. <laughs> People sometimes come up with exotic ways to get rid of the waste, and whenever they come up with something exotic, send it off to the sun. The main effect that that has, and some of my physics colleagues love to come up with these things, I say, look, if you're coming up with an exotic solution, is that because you've concluded that Yucca Mountain isn't good enough? And then they don't know, because they just assumed it wasn't good enough, or why would everybody be talking about it? These are physics professors. And, and not only that, but when you make it exotic, then you make, you're really convinced everybody it's an unsolved problem, which I don't think it is. We have another question back here. I just wonder if you could talk briefly about uh, nuclear fuel reprocessing and how it can you know, prolong the, the life of the fuel and, and yeah. reduce the yeah. amount of uh, radioactivity. 
Okay, well, well reprocessing is when you take out the most radioactive elements uh, simply by chemical means. The most fundamental reprocessing is pulling out the plutonium. Reprocessing, uh, the U.S. considers the reprocessing that took place in North Korea to be illegal uh, because you're pulling out the plutonium. That plutonium can be used as fuel for another nuclear reactor. And if you do it just right, you can wind up getting more plutonium than you started with because what you're doing is converting uranium-238, the depleted stuff, into plutonium. That's called a breeder reactor, and you could actually make more fuel so it'll last until you run out of uranium-238, which is 100 times more abundant, 140 times more abundant. Uh, the United States does not reprocess. It was for two reasons. One is that it feared that reprocessing might lead to the, the, uh, uh, the, the plutonium economy, is the term that, that, that was used at the time under President Jimmy Carter that with the plutonium, with lots of plutonium going everywhere, some of it might get diverted and turned into a bomb. I'm less worried about that now, seeing how well North Korea did with its plutonium bomb. You know, they, they starved their people, they spent billions of dollars to build a bomb and it fizzled. Plutonium bombs are really hard to make. I think my feeling is the plutonium economy issue is not as important an issue as, as many of us used to think. Uh, but the main reason the United States doesn't reprocess is that it's cheaper to get new uranium rather than reprocess the old plutonium. In fact, something like 20% of the uranium that we are now using, uranium and plutonium for nuclear fuels, comes from uranium that we have purchased from Russia, from their bombs that they are dismantling, and they send us the uranium. And this has been a great, you know, an inexpensive source. We get to destroy it, and, and so, uh, We've really been getting about 20% of our of our supplies from old bombs. Where would the other 80% come from? Uh, the other 80% comes from uranium, which we're not running out of. A few years ago, people thought, a few years ago, a few decades ago, people thought we'd run out of uranium. But it turns out that if you're willing to use a lower grade ore, let's say only 10% as much uranium in this ore, you wind up getting 800 times as much uranium. And we're not going to run out of uranium. And the uranium is not a big cost in the nuclear reactor. So the argument for breeder reactors, which I think is unnecessary, or reprocessing for the purpose of reusing that plutonium so it isn't there in the waste for 24,000 years, neither of those arguments are, in my mind, really valid arguments. All right, speaking of breeder reactors. Thank you. Um, I've read about nuclear plant technologies where the fuel is encased in graphite pellets or something like that that yeah. seem to be much less prone to called runaway. pebble bed nuclear reactors. Can you talk about those and how they changed, may change the nuclear waste equation and are they, are they real? Well, pebble bed nuclear reactors are real. They built them in South Africa. They had one in Germany, which they turned off because there was an unexpected accident, not a serious accident, but since it was nuclear, by the way, we could also talk about nuclear versus nuclear. I have some interesting insights on that. Um, but since it was nuclear, uh, they, they, they shut it down. And China is building some pebble bed reactors. Uh, they are an exceedingly safe kind of reactor. Uh, the waste storage problem of the stuff is solid inside these pellets. And, and these pellets are made out of a, a special carbon uh, that is uh, it, it, it's called pyrolytic carbon. It, it doesn't burn, not at any temperature that you can even reach inside of a nuclear reactor. So I, 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 kinda, I really love these pebble bed reactors. They are a next generation of reactors, and I, I don't know whether they're going to take off or not. The current reactors are actually plenty safe enough, but the pebble beds are, are, are a future. And they have the advantage that you can make a little one, then add more on, and you can make them larger as you grow, as you, your energy use grows. And the waste problem is fairly safe. Nobody has come up with any really, really bad accident that can occur with them. So it's a, it's a nice design. We have another question right here. What is, the what is the economics of nuclear power? I mean, when you consider the cost of uh, disposing of the waste, decommissioning the reactor, does it make economic sense for an economy to base its energy okay. on that kind of a system. Okay, there, there are several issues that you raise. One of them is what is the, the, the cost to just install it? Okay, and from the experts, I, I spoke to a group of Bechtel engineers just last week, and I asked them, what does it cost? The, the number we like to use is per installed watt. So you put a one watt nuclear reactor, what does it cost? And, and the answer is about $4. So if you wanted a gigawatt, that would be $4 billion, 
Okay, and that price is comparable to a coal plant, comparable to natural gas is a bit cheaper. Uh, but then the other issue is the environmental costs, the true costs. And I don't know, you know, nobody figures that in for fossil fuels. And, and you just think about what we're doing now over global warming, and you talk about the Iraq war, which I attribute to fossil fuels, nobody puts that in either. Uh, solar is developing very rapidly. And I was at NanoSolar about a month ago, and I was watching, they had these sort of inkjets that print the, the solar cells. It's really amazing, it's not quite that simple. But they, they, they print these stuff, and they believe they could produce solar cells at 50 cents per installed watt. At that point, the main price is no longer the solar cells, it's all the infrastructure and all the support things and having people dust off the, the cells and, and so on. But that's developing very rapidly. You really don't know whether that number that they're selling is meant for the investors or whether it's a realistic number. Very, very hard to tell. But the new technologies, and, and, and solar concentrator, I can talk about that too. Uh, this is where you focus the sunlight to heat something, typically uh, salt. You liquefy the salt. It has the advantage that the salt will stay hot overnight, and you can use the heat whenever you want to. The downside is you got to focus the sunlight. It doesn't work on a cloudy day, whereas ordinary solar works on a, on a cloudy day. So all these ups and downs, but I think uh, so. I'm very excited by solar. There, the most efficient solar cell these days is 43 percent. The cheap solar cells that they're making at Nano Solar are somewhere around 10 percent. That's plenty good enough. So I think solar has a great future. Do, for most solar cells, you have to figure out a way to store the energy. That's not really a solved problem yet. I want to come at this in a different direction, going back to nuclear. What's the argument against it? What, what is the continued argument against the proliferation of nuclear reactors in this country as a source, as a significant, as a significant source of power generation? Okay, I, I think the main arguments are the nuclear waste. I think that that's the argument I hear the most, is the nuclear waste. We just, we just spent a good 10, 15 minutes talking about how the waste is not a huge issue. Well, it is a huge issue. <laughs> this Wait a minute, you just said that curve on the screen just says that over a It shouldn't years. be a good issue if you understand the physics, but that's, that's not the way things are done in this country. So you're saying it's a political issue, not It's a political issue. I think most experts in nuclear power believe that I mean, the politicians are looking for some technical solution. The people who know the technology believe it's a political, it's a matter of convincing the public that this is a, a good thing to do. There's also the distrust of the industry. So both the, everything that you've listed is not in the realm of this science. Oh, it's oh, not, yeah. it's trust and... Oh, I don't, I don't think there are scientific technical issues in going ahead for nuclear power. It's all trust and fear of radioactivity, the unknown, um, the, the, those kinds of issues. So I actually want, I actually want to get some reaction to that assertion. So I think that's important to start talking about the credibility. Well, I'll talk about credibility and trust issues. I assume you know who John Goffman was. Oh, yes. Yes, well, according to John Goffman, who was marginalized by folks like you and your brethren. Uh, please. Well, you may not, but he certainly was marginalized within the profession. But he maintained that there was no such thing as a nuclear power plant that did not have around it an elevated infant mortality and cancer statistic. If that was true, then, then it's crazy. Well, but, but that's not true. That's not true. That's not he true. had the statistics. I know. So for the rest of us, tell us about a little bit more in detail what, the, what this is. Well, it's an old controversy about, I mean, the leakage of radioactivity from nuclear plants is relatively easily measured. And although there were some incidents, the, the levels were, were so low that um, one would not expect any increase. There's always a danger when doing statistics. Goffman was a, was a good scientist, but he had trouble doing statistics, and when he would find an increase in a local place, he would draw attention to it. I, I, I call that process cherry picking. And if you, you know, if you have a theory that global warming is causing coins to come up heads, you throw 100 coins in the floor and see how many heads you can find. If you find 50 of them, you can conclude, yeah, it verifies my theory. I, I, I felt that Gopkin, when he got into the area of statistics, didn't, 
he believed in what he was doing, and as a result, lost some of his scientific detachment. Sorry. Well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the credibility. I, I don't think there are any serious studies today you know, that are supported by peer-reviewed journals and so on that would argue that there were increases. I don't know, even Ralph Nader never claimed that there were increases in, 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 in cancers or other kinds of illnesses in the vicinity of these nuclear power plants. I, 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 really, the most, the strongest opponents of nuclear power didn't concentrate on that because it's, as I said, even with Chernobyl, you can't see it. You can only calculate it. And, and when you think you're seeing things, there's always a danger that, that, that that's cherry picking. So I think that there are good reasons why, sorry, why the public is distrustful of nuclear power, whether they be very real, and I think there are very real reasons historically why they are, as well as perceived, based perhaps on um, you know, ill-informed understanding of the risk. But I don't think that matters, um, because I think there's a deep distrust. So my question is, what do you think would minimize the distrust? What do you think would increase, um, if you think uh, nuclear power is an alternative to fossil fuels, um, what do you think the industry, the government, um, needs to do to increase trust to decrease you know, the historical fear that the nuclear industry is going to once again inadvertently expose the public. Hang, hang, on, one, hang on one second. What, do you, what would increase your own personal trust? Well, I think I would start. I think I would start with uh, truth. Sorry, truth. With truth, uh, transparency, um, and uh, public control which I think is not existent now. Um, and that was one of the, actually, that was one of the uh, community organizing uh, demands in the 70s. Um, 